So what have we learned? We've learned that Lewis electron dot diagram is an analyst to determine if electrons are bonding electrons or non-bonding electrons, but that the Lewis diagrams do not yield accurate bond angles or shapes. If we want to understand the shape of the molecule, we use VSCPR theory. And VSCPR theory says that the molecule will take the shape that minimizes the electron, electron repulsion between the different regions of electron density. Valence bond theory explains how we can go from the atomic orbitals to hybrid orbitals, which explain the shapes that we see in VSCPR theory. This video is on molecular orbitals. Molecular orbital theory is important. It's used in current research to determine the most stable structures of molecules. Uh, molecular orbital theory is very powerful. We'll just go through some very simple parts of molecular orbital theory in this video. What you should be able to do after watching this video is you should be able to describe the basics of molecular orbital theory, describe bonding and antibonding orbitals, be able to describe sigma and pi bonds, should be able to determine bond orders of diatomic molecules using molecular orbital theory, and should determine if diatomic molecules are diamagnetic or paramagnetic using molecular orbital theory. And so Vince shall Valence shell electron pair repulsion theory just says a molecule will take the shape that minimizes the repulsion between regions of electron density. Valence bond theory describes how the atomic orbitals change into hybrid orbitals, which have angles that are consistent with the shapes we saw for VSEPR theory. Molecular orbital theory is completely different. Molecular orbital theory we create completely new orbitals of the molecule. And so if you remember, in terms of atomic orbitals, atomic orbitals are solutions to Schrodinger's equation. And you can only solve exactly when you have just two particles, so one nucleus and electron. So you can solve the hydrogen atom exactly. And then after that, you, you make these approximations. Well, molecular orbital theory is the same thing. We're solving the Schrodinger equation, assuming positions of the nuclei. And we're going to have to do some approximations because we can't solve anything past the two-particle problem um, exactly. Now, we saw that for Venn's bond theory, we took atomic orbitals and we changed them into these hybrid orbitals. Now, molecular orbital theory, we can kind of do a similar thing, LCAO, um, or use the atomic orbitals to form the molecular orbitals. Now, molecular orbital theory is actually a little bit broader than that, but we can think about taking the atomic orbitals to form the molecular orbitals. And again, if you want to find the, the structure of a molecule, what you do is you'd assume positions of the nuclei, you'd calculate the energy of the molecule, and then you'd move the, the nuclei a little bit, recalculate the energy, and do this over and over again until you find the minimum in energy. And that m energy minimum is actually going to correspond to the most stable geometry for the molecule. But one thing you should remember is that molecular orbitals can actually be delocalized over the entire molecule. There are bonding molecular orbitals and anti-bonding molecular orbitals. The anti-bonding molecular orbitals have the, the stars. You should remember sigma, the electron density, is on the internuclear axis, and pi, the electron density, is above and below that uh, internuclear axis. For molecular orbital theory, the bond order is equal to one half of the number of electrons in the bonding orbitals minus the number of electrons in the anti-bonding orbitals. And so if you have two electrons in bonding orbitals and two electrons in anti-bonding orbitals, then they actually cancel each other out. Now that shows you the um, energy as a function of torsion angle for ethane. And so this is looking down the axis of the bond. This is looking at the side. And this was created by doing what was described in the previous slide. You calculate the energies for the positions of the, of the nuclei, and that can give you the energy. Now this one shows you that um, when the hydrogen are closer, you have some repulsion, and that's why you have higher energy, that's less stable. And when the hydrogen are farthest away, that gives you lowest energy, that is the most stable configuration. And this calculation, again, was done using molecular orbital theory. And so what do the molecular orbitals look like? And so this is ozone. And on the left is actually the energy. It's um, in the absolute scale. And so you can see the energies for the different molecular orbitals. And so for the first three orbitals, they pretty much look like atomic orbitals. Um, they're pretty much localized on the different atoms. And notice that the orbital in the center atom is a little bit different than the outside because those they're different. 
And then notice that this is macroorbital, it actually encompasses the entire molecule. And so molecular orbitals can encompass the entire molecule. Remember, electrons are not little particles, but have wave-like properties. And some of the molecular orbitals actually look kind of strange. Um, you can do some manipulation of the orbitals and rearrange them a, a bit. But the most important thing I want you to understand is that molecular orbital theory is important, that it can use to calculate the energies of molecules, and that the molecular orbitals can encompass the entire molecule. We can look at ethene. And so we have that carbon-carbon double bond. And you know, here's the, there's going to be a molecular orbital on one of the carbons. On the other carbon, and those are degenerate, they have the same energy. And again, the energy level diagram to the left is actually in absolute units. And then the next orbital is a sigma bond. And so you have electron density on the internuclear axis, and so that's the sigma bond for the carbon-carbon bond. And then we have basically sigma bonds for the carbon-hydrogen. Now we have four of those, and they are degenerate. They have the same energy. Degenerate just means the same energy. And then we got one more carbon-hydrogen bond to go. And then I think you should have the pi bond for that carbon-carbon bond. Remember, a single bond is typically a sigma bond. A double bond is a sigma and a pi. A pi the electron density, half of it is above and half of it is below. And so those are what some molecular orbitals can look like. And again, a single bond is a sigma, a double bond, sigma and a pi, a triple bond, a sigma, a pi and a pi. And so bonding molecular orbital, you have sharing electron density between two nuclei. Anti-bonding, you're not sharing electron density between two nuclei. Sigma, electron density is on the internuclear axis. Pi, the electron density is above and below the internuclear axis. The bonding molecular orbital has greater electron density in the bond region. So again, bonding, they're sharing electron density, um, maximizing electrostatic attraction. The anti-bonding molecular orbital has reduced electron density in the internuclear region. And so anti-bonding, they're not sharing electron density. And so a question you can see is which of these two should be the lowest in energy? Well, the bonding, you have more electrostatic attraction between the nuclei and the electron density, and so the bonding should be more stable. And so if you look at a sigma and a sigma star, typically the sigma is gonna be low in energy, stronger attraction, and the sigma star will be higher energy. So you can imagine taking two 1s orbitals from two atoms, so this is atom one, this is atom two, and then these combine to form a sigma and a sigma star, a bonding and an anti-bonding. Now again, the sigma means that the electron density is on the nu nuclear axis, and so here's your sigma, sigma, and then up here is your sigma star. And so, in general, bonding molecular orbitals are more stable than anti-bonding molecular orbitals when you're talking about like coming from the same atomic orbitals. And so these are for the 1s. Now for the p atomic orbitals, they'll form sigma and they'll form pi. And so if you remember, you have three p atomic orbitals along three axes, x, y, and z. Now, if the two p orbitals are pointing at each other, then they'll form a sigma and a sigma star. And so again, imagine that this is like the x-axis, and so you have two p orbitals on the x-axis on different atoms, and so that they have electron density on the internuclear axis, and so they will form sigma and sigma star. Now the other two p orbitals, say on the y-axis, and so they're parallel, now they'll form pi and pi star. And so you have three p atomic orbitals per atom. And so the three p's, um, so that gives you a total of six, they'll form a sigma, sigma star, pi, two pi's, and two pi stars. 
And so this is from just the 2p orbitals between two atoms. And so again, on one side is one atom, another side is another atom. As the two atoms come together, their atomic orbitals are changed into molecular orbitals. And so for the p's that are pointing at each other, that's going to be a sigma, electron density on the internuclear axis. For the p's that are parallel to each other, that gives you a pi and a pi star. And so in the second row, you have the 1s, a 2s, and a 2p. And so again, on one side you have one atom, another side and the other, other atom. And so as those two atoms come together, you form these molecular orbitals. Now, um, so the blue is the original atomic orbitals of the two atoms, and then the blue are the molecular orbitals. And so this is kind of what they look like. And so for the 1s, they kind of look like atomic orbitals. There's not a lot of overlap. But the color actually is the, is the phase. And so the bonding are in phase, the antibonding is out of phase. Bonding and then antibonding. So this is your sigma, sigma star, sigma, sigma star. And so the sigma is bonding, the sigma star is antibonding. And then your, here are two pi's, pi bonding. This is the sigma, pi antibonding. So there's nodes between the two nuclei and the sigma antibonding, and again, there's a node there, and a node just means there's a plane where there's no probability of electron being, or there's no electron density. And so say we have two hydrogen atoms come together, and so each hydrogen atom has a single electron in the one orbital. When they come together, they form these molecular orbitals, sigma and sigma star. Now we have two electrons, and so both electrons will go into the sigma orbital. And so filling molecular orbitals is the same as when you fill atomic orbitals. You always fill the lowest energy orbital first, and you can fill a maximum of two electrons per orbital, one with spin up and one with spin down. And so again, one arrow represents m sub s plus a half, the other arrow represents m sub s minus a half. Remember, the magnetic moment from the electron is not due to its spinning, um, it's just purely quantum mechanical in nature. And so if we understand the bond order for this, it's again, bond order is one half times the number of electrons in bonding orbitals minus number of electrons in antibonding orbitals. Now you should remember bond order is number of pairs of electrons being shared. And so that's why we have that one half in front. And so for H2, we have two electrons in the bonding, none in antibonding. And so the bond order is just one. And so it's going to be a single bond. Single bond always has a bond order of two. Double bond always has a bond order of two. Sorry, single bond always has a bond order of one. Double bond always has a bond order of two. Triple bond always has a bond order of three. If we look at helium, two helium atoms come together. So this is one helium atom. This is another helium atom. And so then when they come together, they form these molecular orbitals. And so we have a sigma, a bonding and antibonding. And so for helium, we have the same number of electrons in bonding and antibonding. And so helium does not form a molecule. Helium atoms just stay separate. They do not, um, it's not more stable for them to form a molecule, so they do not form a molecule. If we look at lithium, and so lithium has 1s and 2s. 1s and 2s, and two lithium atoms come together, you form these molecular orbitals. And so, you know, using Lewis diagrams, you probably would not predict Lewis to form a molecule, but Lewis, I'm oh, sorry, lithium ions to form a molecule, but lithium atoms, two lithium atoms, can actually form a molecule. Um, you have more electrons in the bonding than in the antibonding. And so one half, um, four minus two, actually gives you a bond order of one. And so molecular orbital theory can tell you, should a molecule form or will a molecule not form? And so we saw that hydrogen should form a molecule, helium should not, lithium should. If we look at beryllium, it's got, you got each beryllium atom has four electrons, so you have a total of eight. And again, we just fill the molecular orbitals the same as we'd fill atomic orbitals, two, four, six, eight. And so we got four in antibonding, four in bonding. And so equal number of bonding, antibonding. And so we'd predict that beryllium atoms will not form beryllium diatomic molecules. It's not stable for them to do that. Now, one thing you should notice is that um, the core electrons, 
Once we go to the second row, the core just cancel each other out. We have two, bond, two bonding, two antibonding. And so we can actually start just neglecting the core when, when we're talking about the second row. And we can also neglect the atomic orbitals. And so again, on the right, we had atomic orbitals for one atom, left atomic orbitals for the other atom. But why don't we just look at the center? Okay, and so for the center, we have the sigma, sigma star, pi, sigma, pi star, sigma star. Again, we're looking at the second row and we're only going to worry about the valence electrons. So here we have boron. We have three valence electrons for each boron atom. Two times three gives us six. And so we have two, four, six. And we have four in bonding, two in antibonding. Four minus two gives us two divided by two. And so we get a bond order of two. And just like, you know, for the boron atom, we can write down electron configuration as 1s2, 2s2, 2p1. We can write down the molecular configuration as sigma squared, sigma star squared, pi squared. And so we'd predict that boron would form a diatomic with a single bond. If we go carbon, each carbon atom has four valence electrons. It's in the fourth column. 2, 4, 6, 8. And so 2 carbon atoms gives us 8 valence electrons. We got 2, 4, 6 in bonding, 2 in antibonding. 6 minus 2 gives us 4 divided by 2. And so we get a bond order 2. And so using molecular orbital theory, we'd predict that carbon would form a diatomic with a double bond. If we go down to nitrogen, so each nitrogen atom has 5 valence electrons. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. So 2 times 5 is 10. Now we got 2, 4, 6, 8. 8 in bonding, 2 in antibonding. 8 minus 2 is 6 divided by 2, and that gives us a bond order of 3. That's kind of cool. Um, this actually is consistent with what we draw in terms of the Lewis diagram. And so for nitrogen, the Lewis diagram and molecular orbital theory are consistent. We predict that nitrogen has a triple bond. Now, if you remember, when we talked about atomic orbitals, we saw that the 4s and the 3d were really pretty close, and that we usually think about the 4s being filled first and then the 3d, but then as you feel the 3d, um, those orbitals actually go down. But the 4s and 3d are actually pretty close, and there's a, f a fluctuation on, on which is lower in energy. A similar thing happens with the pi and the sigma. And so from lithium to nitrogen, it should go sigma, sigma star, pi, sigma, pi star, sigma star. But if you go to oxygen fluorine, then you actually flip these two because they're pretty close in energy. And so then it goes sigma, sigma star, sigma, pi, pi star, and then sigma star. And so again, from lithium to nitrogen, use the one on the left. From oxygen to fluorine, use the one on the right. And so if we look at oxygen, each oxygen atom has six valence electrons. Two times six is 12. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. And again, we're just filling the energy levels starting at the lowest first and doing a maximum of two per orbital. Remember, Hund's rule for atomic orbitals say that, you know, if you have orbitals that have the same energy, you give each electron their own orbital as much as possible. And so that's what we're doing up here. And so we got two, four, six, eight in bonding, and we got two, four in antibonding. Eight minus four is four divided by two, and so that gives us a bond order of two. And so again, bond order is the number of pairs of electrons being shared, and that's why we divide it by two. And it's kind of cool, it's consistent with the Lewis diagram that we draw. Now one thing that's kind of interesting, if you notice, according to molecular orbital theory, um, we have unpaired electrons. And so that means that oxygen atoms should be paramagnetic. Now, the way we typically draw the Lewis diagram would be having two pairs on the oxygen. And so based on Lewis diagram, we'd say the oxygen is diamagnetic. Based on molecular orbital theory, we'd say the oxygen was paramagnetic. And so this is a magnet, and we have liquid nitrogen and liquid oxygen. And if it's paramagnetic, it's going to get stuck in the magnetic field. Remember, paramagnetic means it's attracted to the magnetic field. Diamagnetic means it's repulsed by the magnetic field. Nitrogen is not magnetic. It is diamagnetic. All the electrons in the molecule are paired. 
Oxygen, however, interacts with a magnetic field because it is paramagnetic. This physical property indicates that molecular oxygen has unpaired electrons. Molecular orbital theory accounts for this fact, but valence bond theory does not. And so one of the things that molecular orbital theory did that valence bond theory could not was predict that oxygen was paramagnetic, which it is. And so nitrogen, all the electrons are paired, and so it's diamagnetic, it's repulsed by the magnetic field. Oxygen has two unpaired electrons, and so it's paramagnetic, it's actually attracted to a magnetic field. If we go to fluorine, fluorine's got seven valence electrons, two fluorines give us 14, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14. So we have 14 valence electrons, we got two, four, six, eight in bonding. We got two, four, six in antibonding. Eight minus six is two divided by two. It gives us a bond of one, and it's actually consistent with the uh, Lewis diagram that we draw. And so molecular orbital theory is consistent with valence bond theory in terms of F2, O2, and N2, except for the paramagnetic behavior of O2, but it's consistent in terms of the bond order, which is kind of cool, with the carbon and the lithium it's a little bit inconsistent. Um, molecular orbital theory is a little bit more accurate. If we look at neon, neon's got eight valence electrons. Two times eight is 16. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16. And so we got two, four, six, eight in bonding. We got two, four, six, eight in antibonding. And so that gives us a bond order of zero. And so we would not expect neon atoms to form neon diatomics and neon doesn't neon's a noble gas and so it just floats away as single atoms and so a question you could be asked is which of the following has the weakest bond and what we do is we just count the number of valence electrons fill the molecular orbital diagrams and determine the bond order and so boron has three nitrogen five it gives us eight plus one is nine two four six eight nine CO minus, so 4 plus 6 is 10, plus 1 is 11, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 11. OF plus, we have 6 plus 7 is 13. We have one less, so that's 12. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. And so we calculate the bond order, we have 2, sorry, 2, 4, 5, 7 bonding and two antibonding, so that gives us five, divided by two gives us a bond order of 2.5. And so bond orders do not have to be integer numbers. Here we have two, four, six bonding, oh sorry, eight, eight bonding, and then three antibonding, and so that gives us five, five divided by two, so that gives us again a bond order of 2.5. Here we have two, four, six, eight bonding, and two, four antibonding, eight minus four is four divided by two, gives us bond order of two. And so the OF plus is gonna be the weakest bond. It's got the smallest bond order. We could look at these as well. And so again, we do basically the same thing. So carbon has four valence electrons, nitrogen five, so that's nine, but we have one less, so that's eight, two, four, six, eight. Here we have four plus five is nine, two, four, six, eight, nine. This would be 10, two, four, six, eight, 10. And now we have two, four, six bonding, minus two antibonding, so that gives us four divided by two, gives us a bond order of two. Here we have two, four, six, seven bonding, two antibonding, seven minus two gives us five divided by two, gives us a bond order of 2.5. 2, 4, 6, 8 bonding, 2 antibonding, so that gives us 6. 6 divided by 2 gives us a bond order of 3. And so the strongest bond is going to have the, sh the shortest bond. And so here we have the most electrons being shared, and so Cn minus should have the shortest bond, has the la largest bond order. Could be asked which of the following is most paramagnetic. And so again, count the number of events electrons, fill the microorbital diagrams, uh, starting with the lowest energy first, maximum of two electrons per orbital. Um, when you have orbitals with the same energy, electrons get their own orbitals as much as possible. And so here we see that this one has two unpaired electrons, so that's going to be most paramagnetic. 
This one's not as paramagnetic, but is paramagnetic because it has an unpaired electron. And then NO plus is diagmagnetic because it has only paired electrons. And so eventually electron pair repulsion sa says that a molecule will take a shape that minimizes the repulsion between regions of electron density. Van Spahn theory says that the atomic orbitals are changed to these hybrid orbitals, and that explains how we can get the shapes that we saw in BCPR theory. Molecular orbital theory creates brand new orbitals for the molecule, so we resolve the Schrodinger equation, assuming a set of positions for the nuclei, and then we keep on doing that until we find the minimum energy, and that should give us the most stable geometry. I hope that helps.